This is Live Well Talk on Diabetes. I'm Dr. Dustin Arnold, Chief Medical Officer at UnityPoint Health, St. Luke's Hospital. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, approximately 37 million people have diabetes in the United States. Joining us today to discuss uh, the management of uh, diabetes as well as its influence on society is Sister LaDonna Wordeman, a certified diabetic educator with UnityPoint Clinic Diabetes Care Center. Sister LaDonna, welcome to the uh, podcast. Thank you, Dr. Arnold, for having me. Yeah, yeah it's a pleasure. We're, we're old friends. We've yes, known each other right. a long time. <laughs> right. So so it's uh, National Diabetes Month this month? That's correct. That's correct. And so we wear blue, and uh, this year's theme is preventing diabetes health problems. We know that on November 14th is the World Day of diabetes. And that was discovered in 1991 by the Iowa, the uh, International Federation for Diabetes and also the World Health Organization. And they chose the 14th of November because that is the birth date of Frederick Banting, who developed insulin yes, along with his assistant Best. Charles Best. Yeah. Yes. Banting, and yes. so over the world, they wear this blue symbol, this color blue, the circle. And they do that because they know that globally diabetes is increasing. And you might think, well, how does that affect us here in Cedar Rapids? At our clinic, we see people from all over the world. Yeah. And some of them are diagnosed in their country. Many are diagnosed here. I'm not an international traveler, right? But it's with uh, COVID, with uh, actually the Ebola concern in 2013, I think, something like that, maybe a little bit later. Um, it, it surprised me how much, how small the world is and how people come and go. Right. Uh, even we had employees that like, they go back to Africa to see their relatives and, you know, they were traveling into these Ebola infested areas. And it's like, wow, you know, right. this is a small world. Right. It is. It, it really is. is. It is. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. So we have 30 sites in Iowa that have a recognized diabetes program. So on November 14th, our diabetes educators in those sites are going to be wearing blue to recognize the significance of diabetes, not only in our country, but around the world. Well, that's, neat. that's neat. Yeah, it is. I don't know if mind boggling is the right word to describe, but I think it's pretty accurate. Uh, what what they did before insulin. Exactly. You know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean people just died. That's you know, correct. From diabetes. That's right. That's correct. Right. That that's just uh very sad. You know, it that was, is. that's why it was such a big uh discovery. Right. Yeah. Right. Over a hundred years ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they uh tog- tied off dog pancreases and then were able to isolate insulin from there. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, often we talk about type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and, you know, going through medical school, you think that there's just asthma and emphysema, and there's ulcerative colitis and Crohn's, and you learn real quick that it's a continuum, and, and that there's not just two categories, that the kind of, there's a continuum, and people are at one end or the other. Could you just briefly tell us what is type 1 diabetes and what is type 2? Well, type 1 we used to call juvenile, but we no longer do that because it can happen even with adults. It means that your body no longer makes insulin. It's an autoimmune disease. So actually, the antibodies kind of attack the beta cells in the pancreas that make the insulin. Type 2 is more prevalent. And actually, when I first studied diabetes, nutrition, years and years ago. We used to call it the old folks disease. You got it when you were 60 or above. But now we see type 2 moving down younger and younger. So that means that your body is still making insulin, but usually you're insulin resistant. You can't use your own insulin as well. Might be they're overweight, might be they're more sedentary, what they're eating. And then we also know that certain ethnic groups are more susceptible. Native Americans. Yes, Native Americans. African Americans, Hispanics, Asians, and Marshall more Islands, to the type in, two. In yes, yes, yes. And then we also are seeing women that have gestational diabetes, and we know that after the baby is born, usually the blood sugars go back to normal. But we do know that they're going to be more at increased risk right, for developing type two later on in life. 
And, and type two is probably the one that causes the most non-diabetic related, well, it's diabetic. A lot of cardiovascular disease happens in the type two. That's right, right. because yeah. the high blood sugars attack many nerve cells around the heart, feet, kidneys. So there's a lot, and eyes, there's a lot of complications that can now, happen. Now, at one time they said that people had type two, maybe two to three years prior to diagnosis. Is that still true? I think that's true. I think that's okay. true. In fact, there are many people probably out there that have diabetes, but have never been diagnosed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not unusual. Sometimes you would get uh, labs on someone and, it, you know, the blood sugar be 230 and they're like, I feel fine. You're yes, like, well, exactly. Yeah, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. What What is the, you know, you talked about the, the medication we mentioned, insulin. But what 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 is the treatment uh, if they're still making insulin? What is the treatment for the type two diabetic? Then? Well, usually the first thing they'll start out with trying to get a healthier meal plan and also exercise. But then sometimes they go on metformin, which is kind of the standard medication to be used, and that's an oral medication that lowers the blood sugars. It's also very affordable. Sometimes they do a combination couple diabetes medications. I know there's been, uh, Dr. McMahon was telling me about some of the newer ones actually have a really preventative cardiac effect. Correct. And kidney effect. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So that's, that's mm -hmm. good. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. The, because I, if I remember the diabetes complication control trial, which basically said if you have controlled blood sugars, you have less disease. But, but I think they were measuring kidney function, weren't they? In they that? were, and they were also with the diabetes prevention trial, which was in 2002, they were trying to prevent going on developing type 2 diabetes. So if you remember, there was about 3,200 people that had what we call prediabetes. Right. So prediabetes means either the fasting blood sugars were between 100 and 125, or if they did it two hours after, they were impaired glucose, those numbers were between 140 and 199. So of these 3,200 people, they all had prediabetes. And they put one group on intensive lifestyle change, what they were eating, also intense exercise. The other group they put on metformin. The group that was an intensive lifestyle 58% of those did not go on to develop type 2 diabetes within the 2.8 years that they did this study. The metformin group, it was like 32%. So we know that prediabetes can stop going on to develop type 2. I, when, and it's a simple weight loss, you not know, when much. I, when I was in medical school and training in the early 90s, it was, they called those people syndrome X. Mm -hmm. And then it became metabolic syndrome. Right. And then... It, and, and then it become became prediabetes. And I've seen that evolve. And at one time, it was just, well, the, the, here they have metabolic syndrome. They probably should exercise, but don't worry about them until they show up with blood sugars through the roof. You know, we didn't, there was no intervention. And uh, I know that I, metformin has an indication in those patients because it will help with some weight loss right, too, right? right? Yeah, right. So that I've seen that change in my, right. my, my right. Uh, career. Right, right, right. And so we actually do offer a class for those that have prediabetes because we, again, want to prevent them from going on to develop type 2. Yeah. Mm -hmm. because, mm -hmm. Just give us an indication. I think a lot of people understand this. The medicines are expensive, but what are some of the other costs of having diabetes? Well, it's interesting that you ask because just yesterday, the American Diabetes Association printed its five-year report. And the economic cost... In 2022, $4.12.9 billion, including $3.6 billion in direct medical costs and $106.3 billion in indirect costs. So those indirect costs are missing work, your productivity right, right. factor. Yeah. That all enters in. And we know that it's increased probably $80 billion in the last 10 years. And they're saying now one in four healthcare dollars goes towards people with diabetes. Because Type one and two. Yes, yes. They spend probably 2.6 the amount that a person doesn't have diabetes on healthcare dollars. So it's well, a huge economic factor. 
Yeah, yeah, you know, I think one of the saddest things, uh, patients that develop diabetic feet, foot ulcers, uh, ulcers of their feet, um, that, that, that usually just the beginning of the end um, for patients. Right. Uh, now, that end may go over 10 years, but not much beyond it. Right. You know, that's a bad sign. It is. It is. Um, yes. Yes. That's why we have people inspect their feet and protect their right. feet. Right. Exactly. 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 And they made the shoes prettier. Yes. At right. one time, they were like Frankenstein shoes. Yes. Right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Now they're a little bit more attractive. <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, tell me a little bit about the uh, diabetic uh, uh, clinical care uh, clinic uh, in the old uh, cardiology. In, you, yes, the yes. Old cardiology yes. PC building. Building. Across right, from right, Immaculate right, Conception. Right, right. Um, tell us a little bit about the services offered there. And... Well, so what happens is we want people to get a referral from their physician or their provider. And then we make sure that we have they have coverage from insurance. And then we offer classes for those that are newly diagnosed, those that have never had diabetes education, those that are going to start on insulin or an incretin, and of course, like I mentioned, those that have gestational diabetes, and then also prediabetes. Yeah. Is, is there is the class last so many weeks? How, do, how does that work? Actually, we usually try to do it in about three to four classes. Okay. Right. right. Mm-hmm. Uh, Medicare allows 10 hours of diabetes self-management training in a year, and most of your insurance companies go along with that also. And I, I used to explain to patients all the time, look, the 15, 20, maybe 30 minutes you and I are face-to-face in the clinic can never accomplish what y- your team does. I mean, right. because it really is, knowledge is power with it. Exactly, and, exactly. You know, but yeah, that definitely right. is so true with diabetes. Right. Because we take a more comprehensive approach, and it's individualized what the patient needs. Very much patient-centered. Well, and like you know, when I trained uh, in medical school, nutrition was a very f- passing topic. Uh, it, we got the really into the biochemistry of carbohydrates and fats, uh, but not not nothing really practical. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, that's changed. I talk to the medical students yes. when they come by because I think that's important. It is important. Um, it, it, because it, it will surprise me talking to patient, family members, friends, that the just uh, people don't realize how many calories they're consuming in beverages they drink. Right. It's just it's not even on their radar. That's uh, right. That's right. You know, and, and that it could be a lot. Right. <laughs> right. Or the amount of soda that they drink yeah. in a day's time. The, I had a buddy, his dad worked at the old PepsiCo, Pepsi, and he they they said like a case of Mountain Dew was a pound heavier than a case of Pepsi because of <laughs> right, the sugar. Right. That's, that's, that's crazy. <laughs> so how, a list, how does a listener get... Uh, um, to our to, clinic? To, yeah, to your clinic, a referral, you said. So what I would suggest is that they talk to the PCP and get a referral. And there's actually four times they should be referred when they're newly diagnosed or if they've never had diabetes self-management training or if there's change in care or annual review. And then, of course, change in lifestyle. Let's say their spouse dies and now they're all by themselves. Well, that during the grieving process, that can cause blood sugars to really go up. Or let's say they have to go to a care center or assisted living. That's a major change. Right. So all those times... They need to be referred. Mm-hmm. And it's valuable knowledge. I right, mean, Because right. It's, it's not just simply eating healthy. It's, it's That's really, right. It's really to have strategies and backup plans and troubleshooting. Exactly. days you don't feel well. And I mean, goals. And, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, you know, I, I've never, as long as I've known you, I've, <laughs> I've never asked you this question. Why did you become a diabetic educator? How did you get interested in that? Well, I worked for Iowa Lutheran Hospital for 13 and a half years as a clinical dietitian. And there were three different times when the nurses said, you need to go in to see this patient, but they're going to throw you out of the room because they're so angry. And I, it's interesting because I could still see the rooms they were in. So I would go in, and yes, they about ready to throw me out. But the reason they were so angry, it was the night before they had an amputation. And so I thought, you know, it doesn't have to be this way. Right. If they had some education, I'm a strong advocate of education. If they could manage their diabetes, that's what we do. We give them the tools. Then they can use quality of life because 
must be awful to lose a limb or a leg because you have diabetes. Right. Yes. So that's how I became a diabetes educator. That's fascinating. <laughs> and how, how many years have you done it now? Well, if you count the times I was a clinical dietitian, probably about 30 years. 30 years. Yes. Wow. Yes. That is, mm-hmm. That's <laughs> That's pretty impressive. Well, Sister LaDonna, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having uh, me. Once again, this is Sister LaDonna Wardeman, a certified diabetes educator with Unity Point Clinic Diabetes Care. For more information, visit unitypoint.org. Thank you for listening to Live Well Talk On. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your family, friends, neighbors, strangers about our podcast. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, or wherever you get your podcast. Until next time, be well.